Well, thank you very much, and thank you to all of our panelists. I think we heard some very uh, interesting presentations on the history of the petrochemical industry in the kingdom, the development of petrochemicals, and the future of petrochemicals, which is indeed exciting. When you look at uh, the chart one of the panelists had that showed all the new materials that are coming to the kingdom um, and what that should mean in terms of materials being available for downstream industries and for more investment in Saudi Arabia, it's, it's indeed uh, very exciting and a, and a lot of opportunity for all of us to invest in a lot of the, uh, all the entrepreneurs. So we do have a variety of questions. I'm going to combine a few of them together because some of them are along a similar theme. And the first question has to deal with uh, manpower in Saudi Arabia. There are several questions around uh, workforce, and uh, Mark gave us a little bit of an overview of, of what they, have, they found in, in uh, Jubail with the workforce. But the question is, as we move into these downstream industries, what are each of your companies doing, and, and indeed, what's the kingdom doing to make sure that there is a world-class workforce available, as there has been for you, for these new investments. So would someone like to start on that one? Go ahead. Uh, I would like to uh, focus initially on professional workforce. Uh, I think you all have heard about the uh, ongoing effort uh, on the education end. And that always gave us the opportunity to always uh, recruit uh, as, as professionals the best professionals we can find. Uh, if we look at SABIC today, uh, we in Saudization, uh, especially in manufacturing, in many of our sites we have exceeded 80, and actually in many of them we are close to the high 98 or 95 percent. Most of those talents we, we are using, uh, not only in the professional end, we also, when we look at the operators as well as the technicians and the maintenance, Provided you give the people the right training, you put them in the right working environment, you incentivize them, you get the best out of them. We found among the best operators we have today is our Saudi operators. Behind the board, we managed in many of our plants using those operators to reduce the number of stations to run a very complex plant. And that may be explained uh, the uh, competitiveness that we continue to maintain. At the same time, and I think some of our panelists here already mentioned it, a good speaking of an excellent team on the site is the safety records you achieve. I think we all of us here pride ourselves in having an excellent safety performance. We run complex assets, very expensive assets, and mind you, also dangerous assets if you mismanage them. And we run them with Saudi talent, and that's always had delivered. Now, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, there are more and more specialized <coughs> training institutes are put in place to train operators and also to engineers further after they finish their university for application. We in SABIC have already put a plastic institute in Riyadh designed to train high school graduates to operate uh, extruding machines, uh, blow machines, uh, for the polyurethane business, for almost any of those materials applications, we continue to expand that capability. This is started at the beginning with very low application. Today, that institute already have exceeded its capacity the institute was equipped with the best equipment, the best curriculum, experts from around the globe, because the whole idea, you are trying to put together a sophisticated value-add industry, and at the heart of this, going to be the talent you put behind. So that's a little, little talk. Uh, another thing we are doing today, and we recognize it to be very important to expand that workforce and to make it available, and that's really looking at our contractors, and I think some of us also do the same, where we work with them to look at certain jobs that add value and work to, to attract Saudis into those jobs and train them. In recent surveys of also Saudi talents, graduates, what surprised you? People are looking for companies that make them work hard, people that, companies that challenge them, 
companies that stretch them, many of them willing to compensate and give up nice weekends, long weekends, give up summer holidays, in lieu for advancing and betterment. So I, I believe we have today uh, a country with a transforming culture also, with attitude towards work. So that's what I can say. Somebody else? Yeah, maybe I can, I can add. Please. Yeah, I think um, from, from our perspective as, as DAO, you know, we, we just announced a data. So our experience in terms of manpower uh, depends very much on our existing joint ventures with the Jafalis, uh, which is really very much in line when you talk about downstream businesses. So th the size of, of perhaps the challenge is not as big as that for uh, a bigger petrochemical uh, site. But having said that, I think, I think a lot of focus now, we talk a lot about uh, technical training, getting the engineers, the process engineers, but I think, and that is fine, uh, and certainly is needed. Um, and it's, in my view, I think it's, it's very, very important. We have also experiences in, in value parks in Europe, uh, whereby we have uh, put our training uh, programs and training institutes integrated within the value park and within the, uh, the setup of the petrochemical site. But I think we, we tend to forget or we tend to put it a little bit on the side and that is the training for the support functions, uh, supply chain, customer service, um, you know, IT. These things are extremely important, if not as important as the focus on, on our engineers and technicians. Uh, you, can, you can be the most uh, advanced technologically producing chemical company in the world, but if your customer service organization is, is weak, then you, you lose half of the battle. And I think you know, some of the training programs should also address, uh, address these things. Um, I think this, as I said, it becomes much more important once you also go downstream in your uh, value chain. Thank you. Uh, let me just add a couple of comments from our perspective. Uh, you know, we've had multiple cycles of hiring now because we've been in the kingdoms, uh, in, the, in these downstream industries since the 70s. And a lot of the folks that we initially hired have, uh, have retired or are in the process of retirement. We're continually bringing in more and, and more folks. Even with that retirement, the joint ventures that we have with Sabek and the refinery with Saudi Aramco are over 90% Saudi uh, nationals. So the, you know, what we do is you know, we, we work with the local technical colleges. We, we bring these young men in. Uh, we give them you know, some type of internship a lot of on-the-job training, and they become absolutely wonderful employees in all facets of our operation. So from you know, maintenance to process operations and, of course, to engineers and accountants and all those type of things. Our ventures are completely Saudi-managed. The senior management is, are all Saudis, and um, for the most part, again, people that have grown up through our plants and through our systems. For our new uh, investment in the, uh, you know, in the rubber uh, cluster, part of the automotive cluster, we have two training initiatives. One is an initiative to train technicians to work in the, uh, uh, in the rubber field. And the other is um, a, uh, uh, an initiative to help customers develop new products and train their employees. And we, we're putting together with our, with our partner, Sabek, an institute with the University of Akron in the United States, kind of the hotbed of all this activity, is in Ohio. The University of Akron has the best program, and so we've, you know, we've brought them over to help design a program, how to train people, how to develop some of these innovative processes so that new downstream industries can be put on the ground in Saudi Arabia. So I think for those of you thinking of coming to Saudi Arabia, you'll, you'll find no shortage of hardworking, eager, um, smart, ready to be trained in, in your specific operation, uh, young folks in Saudi Arabia to come and help, help you. We have a question, too, on local content. As we see all this building going on in the kingdom, and I remember back in the 70s some of the projects we did because there wasn't a lot of local capacity. We actually used modular type of approaches and built a lot of the things offshore, brought them in on modules. And of course, today in Saudi Arabia it's a lot different. There's a lot more capacity to do things. and so. 
If you could just get, you know, share a few thoughts on what you do within your companies to ensure that local companies uh, are involved to the maximum degree uh, in your projects in Saudi Arabia. Wyatt, do you want to start? Uh, as far as <coughs> local content is concerned, really, uh, as Mike alluded to, there was a very substantial development of the downstream industries and the services industries in Saudi Arabia. So the supplies of variety of products are easily available within Saudi Arabia today. Structural steel, for example, uh, virtually you don't need to import any structural steel in Saudi Arabia. And that applies to other, uh, m many, many uh, aspects of the construction industry. I still remember a project which was basically managed by Abdullah. Uh, I mean, initial furnaces, uh, cracking furnaces, were imported as complete modules from Japan back in the early 80s. Uh, I think each module w w weight was in the neighborhood of 1,600 tons or 1,800 tons. Then within a couple of years, we had an expansion project and Abdullah was the manager of that. And we managed to build those furnaces in Saudi Arabia, in Jubail, a uh, few meters away from their final location. Then they were trucked from that location. And he was telling us that the weight dropped by something like 200 or 300 metric tons of each of those modules. And we were surprised why. He said, because usually when you transpe transport those modules over the seas, you would design them for the dynamic loads on the ship, which are substantially more what that they are exposed to when they are stationary on the ground. And so it is really a number of advantages when you build locally. And what applies to structural steel applies to variety of other products. The cables industry is very well sub uh, developed in Saudi Arabia as well as m many others, even piping. Now, today we have the first uh, seamless pipe already started up in Jubail in Saudi Arabia. So really s supplies in Saudi Arabia, uh, obviously local contractors today are playing a very major role in providing uh, sophisticated uh, services. Also, even in the engineering field, many of the international engineering firms and also some of the local firms had already developed some capabilities to support a lot of the engineering work in Saudi Arabia. Really, Aramco was uh, pioneering in that field by driving the engineering companies to establish local capabilities. So really, there are many, many ways of enhancing the local content, not at cost, on the contrary, to enhance the cost structure of the project. If you look, uh, we have done a survey back in a few years ago, and we found over a four years period, if I recall, I collect, uh, it's between 2005 until at that time 2008. If you look at the GCC countries, uh, including, of course, Saudi Arabia, the chemical as well as the gas and oil size of construction industry was approximately $400 billion. That is a very huge industry by any standard. We also we know when, we, when you build a project, you actually create uh, an industry on its own, building that plant. And it's up to you. You can do it temporarily and dismantle everything and take it out, or <coughs> actually put some of that concern and leave it on the side for the growth. Now, if you are in the East Province, you are actually within a short sale to any of the GCC countries. Uh, and with the GCC cooperation, that, that material can always move with its local content without an issue. So I think the chemical industry, the gas and oil industry, and when you add the power generation, they are almost similar in the same field, and you add this on, that's a huge industry. And, and that's really an industry, if you look at the cluster, there was not much of focus because there is a huge market. And I think 
companies like uh, Sabic, companies like Saudi Aramco, I'm sure Stico and others would love to see people come down there, build their facility, make plans, and also supply us with equipment because guess what? We, in the long term, we cut down the cost of our value chain, we reduce our spare, and we can deal with short-term issues that may occur with our plants in a quicker way. So I think that's a huge industry and that's a huge market. Thank you. Davila? Yeah, thank you. I think um, as uh, my colleagues here uh, alluded to, local content is very crucial in, uh, in today's market to have sustainable and successful business at the uh, location you're intending to invest. Uh, over the years, uh, Saudi Aramco have uh, further and further strengthened its uh, uh, contracts and its procurement agreements to encourage and put specific percentages of, uh, of local uh, uh, contents so that uh, uh, we are able to have a successful partnership with the investors uh, for future sustainability, for uh, securing uh, the proper response time in terms of support, maintenance. Uh, and uh, regarding the experti expertise, I'm quite really uh, excited to see the emphasis uh, the local industry as well as the government that they are uh, rapidly trying to uh, cater to the industry sector and to develop a lot of the young people. A lot of free education is being offered by the kingdom for the locals. And there, a lot of our young uh, men and women are now uh, uh, being educated all over the world in almost every field quite exciting and quite amazing the amount of investment the kingdom is, is putting uh, to encourage the investors to come, but also to prepare the workforce locally uh, to support those, uh, uh, those uh, investors for successful uh, uh, opportunities, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have one last topic. We've had several uh, questions on this. and. Uh, Generally, the topic is the long-term competitiveness of the chemical industry in Saudi Arabia. And the background is that, that Saudi Arabia has had this marvelous development and, and uh, hopefully will be moving downstream into a lot of these value-added industries. But if you look at the world of, of uh, chemicals, things are changing. You see uh, Saudi Arabia's feedstock is getting very tight. Uh, it's been well used, been used for great advantage, but there's no question it's, it's getting very tight in terms of chemical feedstock. You see in the United States, very inexpensive now natural gas because of the success of the, of the shale gas program there, which now provides about a third of U.S. natural gas and provides a lot of low-cost ethane, providing competitiveness for U.S. assets that perhaps weren't as competitive or competitive at all in the world market, in the export market. So the question is, as you look at your Saudi businesses and the advantages and disadvantages they may have, and, and for most of us, I know it's true, we do access the export markets as well as the domestic and regional markets. How do you see that competitiveness playing out? How do you see the emergence of perhaps some more competitors in North America or other, other parts of the region? And, and what do you see for Saudi Arabia going forward in terms of its ability to compete in the export markets? Please. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, if we come and look at the uh, chemical industry, we always had been, uh, if we look at the, uh, the, the feed plus one or the feed plus two, naturally there, the, f the resource itself play a big role in setting your competitiveness. And today, uh, no question, with the shale gas, uh, I would argue the U.S. may be a second in the role in competitiveness. Nonetheless, uh, the current legacy's uh, assets will continue to maintain its competitiveness because I think we learn very well how to maintain them, run well, and we also know how to innovate around them to keep those infrastructure and those legacy platform running well. Looking ahead, we're doing two things. 
uh, to maintain a competitiveness, but also to add value to the uh, molecules we produce. One is to take them further in the downstream, and that's really uh, raise the very important question why we do that. Uh, one important thing, we are blessed as a chemical industry with the government policy to go and diversify and create industries that will use some of those chemicals as we build uh, those assets. So that will add value to us. The second thing, we like others, we have great innovations. Some of them we cannot speak about them, but you will see some breakthroughs in the near future that will create a new competitive advantage for Saudi Arabia, also in the chemical business. SABIC have also leveraged itself, its experience, its capabilities, its technology, its management system, and we went and we globalized ourselves. That gave us a number of advantages. Of course, we appreciate those who welcomed us, accepted our knowledge, and trusted us into their resources and their market. But what that gave us, give you a stronger supply chain, a deep penetration in those markets, which at the end enable you while penetrating those markets to continue to complement your production cycle. You could produce some in Saudi and complete them at the last end. We already do this in certain product where we make the basic product in Saudi Arabia and we add value to it in the market through compounding it and increasing its value. So that's, that's what the industry will do. So you can argue maybe gas is getting tight. I'm sure Aramco has some surprises for us here, <laughs> and then I hope so. Uh, but there is still a lot of hydrocarbon in Saudi Arabia, and we shall not forget that. And, and those are available with the right innovation and the right technology will continue to enable further advantages for the industry. And, the, and we are now 35 years, people say we are young. I think young is when you expect the best output. So I think we learned a lot. And we're ready, really, to take Saudi Arabia to a new height in, in, in this uh, competitive world and in, in, in the, uh, the world of uh, chemical and petrochemical business. Thank you, Abdullah. Mark, did you want to? Yeah, I, I was just going to add that uh, I think you know, b before shale, uh, the U.S. Gulf Coast in particular was, was stayed competitive because of just the level of integration among cooperating companies. They were still competitors, but there were interconnections and inter interlocking uh, delivery grid systems that really raise that level of competitiveness to a whole new level. And I think what you're, you're seeing, and it's underway in, in Jubail Industrial City, is cooperation amongst companies like ourselves, Tasni, Savic, Aramco, to develop that same kind of synergistic cooperation that will put another level of competitiveness in there that just really uh, adds to the long-term viability of the industry. Very quickly, um, I think, um, well, first of all, the, the hub of the hydrocarbon industry is here in the region. And, and, and you cannot say that it's becoming uncompetitive versus what? Um, you know, you compare the gas, shale gas, to the gas here, it's still very competitive here. That's one thing. And secondly, you know, if you look worldwide, where is it that you have such relative abundance of feedstocks? So this will remain the hub for the petrochemical industry. Now, competitiveness that does not depend only on, on your feedstock. Competitiveness depends on how, on your process technology, depends on your product mix, how you, go, how you, create, how you use innovation to differentiate your product from, from the competition. And I think, you know, if you look at companies like Dow over the past 10 years with the spike and the volatility of feedstocks, and we didn't have a, a presence here. I mean, we survived that. If you, if you do the calculation, and it's, it's public knowledge, how much feedstocks cost we had to absorb, yet we survived it. How did we survive it? By, by managing it in the most effective way, uh, creating innovation, diversifying our product mix, and that's how you, do, that's how you survive. Well, we're, it seems we're out of time, so let me wrap this up by thanking all of you for attending the panel. And please join me in thanking our panelists for their excellent presentations. Thank you.